giving the old girl some spit and polish before we send her out the door. It's Vija, please. A heinous trip at Warp 5. My name is Joseph. And I'm just a regular old run-of-the-mill murderous AI here to make you pay the iron price. Your co-host, Peter. And if you missed it last week or the last couple of weeks, we've talked about our store. And yes, we do have leggings. <laughs> What Star Trek fan isn't in the market for a new pair of branded leggings for their favorite podcast? Zephus.store. Go check it out. I told my wife about it. She First of all, she was amazed that there were stickers of my face. And then I told her about the leggings and she said, are you for real? I said, yeah, you fuck up this Christmas. It's That's gonna what it's going to be under the tree. The divorce leggings. Uh-huh. Joe... I'm putting you on the spot here. I didn't discuss it before our little uh, our little strategy plan off air. Oh, no. Do you want to stoop with me down to a bit? I would love to do a bit with you. Amongst my best memories are our bits. My mom, I don't know. She goes to these garage sales. She ends up with stuff. She saddled me with this Star Trek trivia game that there is nobody in my house that will ever play this with me and also it's original series so I don't know any of this stuff so rather than me throw this out I figured it might be fun if uh, since we don't have any rules of acquisitions to talk about anymore I read a couple of these off to you and of course the audience listening and see just how much of a neckbeard you are on this original series stuff this is quite a basic bit but I accept the premise and is the this, challenge. Is this stuff other people are doing? Are we? Are we I stealing? I mean, this 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 feels like we are spirit. We are spiritually stealing. I mean, I haven't watched. I haven't listened to Greatest Generation in a long time. But this sounds like some shit they would do. Mm, maybe yeah, we I shouldn't mean, do this then. Well, maybe we don't make a bit. But now I want to know the question. See if we can know the answer. So just cough right, it I'll, up. I'll lay, I'll lay a couple on you, and then. Okay. Uh, and then I might have some other Star Trek news to cover before we jump in. Uh, here we go. This is all about trivia. Who threw the first punch in the bar brawl on Deep Space Station K7 in the Trouble with Tribbles? Uh, it would be Scotty. You are correct. Because he insulted the ship. Name the crew member of the ISS Enterprise who saved Captain Kirk from the Mir Chekhov's assassination attempt in Mirror Mirror. I, I mean, I remember the guy doing it, and then he got, like, punched in the face for his trouble, but I don't remember his fucking name. Come on. It's Feral. Feral. Okay. Uh, yeah, I remember well, he was, I, like, some douchebag. He was just some guy. Well, I think this is a good place to stop, then. Uh, the first one you get wrong, we, we call it there, so we're not torturing people unnecessarily. What an interesting kind of divide, though. Like, of a general, like, it's it's a pretty small but obtainable question of... In this famous scene, in this famous episode, who threw the first punch? And there's like a scene after that where that's a focus. So that's like a good question. And then who's the name of this extra that has one line in one episode whose name is mentioned exactly once ever in the entirety of Star Trek? Like, there's two different kinds of fans. And I'm really glad I didn't fucking know the answer to the second one. <laughs> there's colors oh, on this. Woo. Of course, I've never, I'm not going to read the, the rules here, but the first one was a blue question. That was a green question. I wonder if like the red and then the gold and the white questions just get harder and harder. I don't know. Things to ponder. Something, something for our fans to decide if they want more of. Moving on. Season two, episode four, dead stop. Kind of already mentioned the big revelation from this, which is, you can take the Bolana out of Star Trek, but apparently you cannot get Roxanne Dawson away from murder AIs in another television program that she herself is voicing. But aside from that, this this episode has a ton of continuity. This is like porn compared to what we dealt with in Voyager, where we were happy if they occasionally acknowledged that there was something going on outside of the 48 minutes of that episode it wasn't until what was it fractured is that uh chakotay saves the day and we go in like the tour de force of voyager's biggest goofs i mean that was the big one but there were times occasionally like you know the when especially when the kazon and and seska and like the good old days of season one and two 
there's a little bit more episode to episode shit going on. Yeah, um, but I mean, this has call outs all over. Oh, yeah. The place. But this is this is next level. This is next level. I love this episode. I do too. Um, I really, I know you weren't too big on the last one, which was Minefield. But uh, I liked last episode, and I, I think this is going to be the first episode for season two where I'm going to like give it the five out of five scale. This was first aired October 9th, 2002, written by Mike Sussman and Phyllis Strong, which are two names we have seen many times, directed by Roxanne Dawson, uh, who still has not really established any definitive visual style. Um had there been a smattering of cum on someone's face here, I, I could draw some connections, but uh, she has overall, I would say, I don't know, bland, not bland. It's not offensive. It's, it's good. It's adequate, adequate in yeah. a good way. And her three episodes so far are all quite different. And Dorian incident, Voxola and this all very, very different kinds of stories, basic stories. So hard to say that there is any kind of uh, thing she's particularly good at quite yet. Uh, also, the yeah, the the decision to cast her as the voice of the the space station AI, and that's the second time I believe she's been an AI voice because it was what uh, Juggernaut, Juggernaut, where the, which was one of my least favorite episodes. Gosh, was I, that, it? I was a real fucking turkey. That was the one with the Cardassian murder missile. Super that Saiyan she, weapon that could have brought the Federation to its knees that conveniently ended up in the Delta Quadrant. What a piece of shit. But yeah, this one is the, very much not. Uh, and it has a lot to do with it being a shadow two parter. This episode is about the last episode, or more specifically, the fact that the ship got fucked up. And. Perhaps that is why uh, you and I are such immediate fans, because what do they never do in Star Trek, Peter? Clean up the mess. That is correct. Of the one a consistent thing about Star Trek is that if the ship is fucked up in the prior episode, it's fine by the next one. And you'll be damned if you're actually going to see any of the uh, the process for which the 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 ship is uh, going to be repaired uh, between those two moments, it, as seen on TV in the twenty fourth century, the Federation has stockpiles of uh, a spishax space wax. You just a little dab, you rub it on the hull, and entire bulkheads recreated. Everything you're saying right now completely true, and this is there are many parallels between Enterprise and Voyager, specifically. You are far from home with minimal support and you got what you got and anything beyond that, you're at the mercy of whoever's around you. Enterprise has had to deal with repercussions over and over again. Voyager doesn't matter how bad it got its ass kicked, what binary star it flew through. However, many of the nacelles exploded by that next episode with a swish and a flick of the wrist. You got a brand new model on deck and, and all even, of the shuttlecraft you could possibly want. Oh, yeah. Just just stock all the torpedoes over. doesn't matter. Now, to be fair, we can say that it it is 24th century technology and maybe somewhere in the deep in the bowels of Voyager, there is industrial replicators and they can just literally reprint new bulkheads and, and be very self-sufficient because of this. I don't know. What do we gonna call this? This crucifix that uh, next gen era nailed itself to, which is transporters and replicators, which solve all plots easily enough. Enterprise doesn't have access to the replicators, at least, so you get stuff like this. But uh, really, it's just gonna come down to continuity, Voyager's allergy towards it, and Enterprise thankfully embracing it. So the teaser here is a direct segue in from Minefield, where they are taking a look at the giant piece of the saucer section that's been blown away. And Trip is giving Archer some bad news. And that news is they can't really effectively 
defend themselves at this time. They cannot polarize the plating and they have a giant, you know, gaping wound. They don't have the raw material to do the repairs. If they found the raw materials, it would take them months to complete. And lastly, and most importantly, because this of this open wound, the best speed they could make is warp two, which because they're so far out means that they are many years from Earth. He said they, what? A decade from Jupiter Station. Correct. And then my first thought is like, well, maybe this is a situation where we swallow our pride and call the Vulcans for help because this is well within Vulcan shot. But unfortunately, wouldn't you know it, along with uh, not being able to polarize a hull, uh, they are not able to utilize the subspace uh, echo network. So they are completely cut off and for all intents and purposes, not dead in the water, but they're, they're super fucked. So Archer makes the executive decision. We're going to go ahead and cast a net out there and hope that someone hears us and will help us. And there's some instant suspicion that I really liked of like, is that a good idea or not? There is some fucked up shit we've run up to out here. Are you going to tell the spider people that lunch is ready? And Archer just buries the thought by saying, listen, we've done our good deeds uh, when people have called for help. It's our turn to get lucky. Let's go out there and call for some help. Let this moment sink in. Uh, Not only is there some bad stuff floating around in space, there's a lot of bad stuff you've done in space. You've made a lot of enemies. You've stuck your dick in many bowls of mashed potatoes that did not belong to you. You are, for all intents and purposes, legitimately classified terrorists on more than a couple planets. And now would be a great time for some people to come fuck your little ass up, including the Romulans who may have flipped a coin and decided they want to kill you after all, uh, who caught you with that mine. What did they say? It was four days since they got in the mine. Correct. So this is a big risk, but I love this moment. And this is in essence, the Federation dream, right? That we will go out, we will do good. We will build hopefully enough goodwill through our selfless actions that now when it's our turn, to ask for help, help will arrive on us. And this is how we build a galactic community. We cannot always have the upper hand. Sometimes we need to participate in this, this universe by being the ones requiring assistance. Well, I guess before we get to the answer to that call, we do have a brief scene in sick bay where we have more continuity because Reed is dealing with the, uh, the bomb he took the, to the knee. Or shall we say the bomb uh, stabilization device he took through the thigh. He got harpooned. And he's getting some physical therapy from Flux, which which was a neat touch. Uh, this episode goes out of its way to demonstrate that while Flux has, by 21st century standards, some amazing technology at his disposal, uh, he still can't magic away a wound with a wand. Uh, He has to, you know, slowly apply treatment and then do resistance training with Reed over the course of several days until he can actually walk. So even though his ability to fix a wound of that caliber is quite profound, that's still relative to the 24th century medical technology uh, primitive in a way. He doesn't get a blinking light to fix wounds he's he's old school he's dark ages he's got worms and the whole takeaway from that scene was that throw it not a throwaway line but uh no you cannot put the blood worms anywhere near me again you still haven't found all the ones you put in the last time in flocks is like it's just one that's missing and it'll come out eventually when i'm like i don't know if he's intimating that this thing's gonna get pooped out crawl out a nose or if uh reads in for the most interesting kidney stone of his life. <laughs> I did like the line that uh, Flock said, uh, I cannot cause harm, but I can cause as much pain as I'd like. <laughs> like there's yes, a difference. I saw a dear doctor. Thank you. There's a difference between uh, your treatment causing you pain and your treatment causing you harm. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. yes, this is good pain. 
Mr. Reed, you're going to suffer. But uh, during this, this side story, uh, they get a response from a Tellarite fleet freighter. Speaking of strange new worlds. Yeah, so the Tellarites are, I guess the Tellarites are best flushed out in lower decks, to be honest with you. Uh, the That's really the, the first uh, time you've seen them really like as Starfleet officers was in lower decks. I'm happy to say the Tellarites end up being a relatively important part of Enterprise as well, so you'll get to see them here. Uh, but this is uh, one of the first mentions of them chronologically in Earth's history. And they are nice enough not to stop and help, but at least give you directions to the closest rest stop. They're like, yeah, bro, if you keep going down the road, there's a whole fucking there's a whole ass exit with some stuff on it. It's over here. I was curious about that because they get a transmission. It's garbled. Because, like, the Tellarites are right at the edge of communications. That's like, A, uh, repair station, garble, 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 something. I almost wondered, based on what happens, if the Tellarites were just saying, like, hey, we can't help you, but watch out for that repair station. Like, if, if that was a warning to stay the fuck away, and maybe if this repair station, like, everybody knows it's bad news. And they're they're just trying to tip them off, or if this was a genuine like, yeah, you can go get fixed up over there. It's cool. Don't worry about it. It'll only cost you. It only An cost you a little leg. bit. <laughs> they decide it's worth a look, and they warp over to what we will find out is space buckies. Peter, I believe we have mentioned buckies on this program in numerous the, times in in the past. They actually sponsor us now, by the way. Yeah, uh, not because they pay us money, but because we want <laughs> we want so desperately to simp for them. Uh, uh, Buggies being the world's greatest truck stop slash rest stop for travelers. And I call it that because not only is this place full service for actually taking care of the Enterprise, it's uh, full service in terms of its meal capacity, which is an important part of the Buggies experience as well. Yeah, everything about this place is cool. They show up to the uh, coordinates. They start hailing. There's no responses. Uh, They see that the docking berths uh, are way too small for Enterprise. They scan the internals. It is completely inhospitable. I think it's like a liquid hydrogen atmosphere that's like super cold or something. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big fat nope, and everybody's a little heartbroken. And then suddenly, like a Chinese finger puzzle, this thing starts unfolding. The uh, the dock area gets huge, and it turns. It almost gives me like uh, feelings of um, Utopia Planitia shipyards, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it folds out into that kind of format, and it does that after scanning Enterprise, so it could very well have seen what Earth space docks look like and purposely emulated the shape. Interesting thought. And one of my favorite things about this episode is there's a lot of stuff that is not specifically or explicitly explained. It's just inference by what you're seeing. And that has become one of my favorite storytelling methods for uh, Star Trek. And it, I, you know, we, we discussed it heavily back in Voyager. And it's like, if you, if you let me draw my own conclusions, I'm not going to let myself down. Where's your writing room? I'm almost certainly always. <laughs> yep. Those acts are going to fucking write up. So mm-hmm. let's avoid them. So not only is the docking repair area changing, they find out that the internal atmosphere and environment of the station is changing right into line with uh, human needs. They still aren't able to get anybody on the horn. They don't see any life signs in there. Curiously given what happens in the end. And I'm guessing that's probably a shielding issue. They don't really have many other options. So they fly on over, they get in the the repair bay, they dock the ship. Of course, Uh, the fact that the entire galaxy is already using a standardized docking hatch, uh, umbilical connector type. Very convenient. Very convenient. Don't need need an adapter. You're good. Apple gave up. They're using the uh, USB-C port, right? Absolutely. The dock wars are over. 
and they walk over to a very sterile um classic sci-fi I don't know utopia but uh it's it's that it's that white clean room right yeah it's super sterilized and they get onto the station it definitely does not feel like something lives there and that is when you see some high technology you well, hold on a sec well, while they're walking across that dock man like so deep down inside I, I so badly wanted to see Cardassian hallway used on that fucking <laughs> That's my only real criticism for this oh. episode was like if there was a place to jam the Cardassian hallway, it was here and it would have been so sweet. We were so innocent then, Peter. And it's because it, it would have been perfect. A perfect reuse of a pre-existing asset, because for all the callback and continuity that this story has, their proper use in this is unprecedented at least two, if not more uh, props that get used in this, that like, even without reading the memory alpha, I was like, holy shit, are they? Oh yeah. When they use the nomad probe. Yeah. Not just that. Well, first of all, so, so they get in, they walk through the hallway uh, and they get in like the, uh, the lobby basically. Right. And that's where they're going to start interfacing with the computer. They find out that enterprise has been scanned. There's a holographic projection, trips like holy shit this is everything that's wrong like their ability to uh map the ship and and any defects is unprecedented not only is there like the major damage but and you mentioned it during broken bow when uh trip bumped the hull with the the inspection pod or whatever you're like this is gonna gonna come back this could come up later (laughs) and he's like holy shit there's that fucking scratch i put on there and archer's like well i thought i told you to fix that and he's like You've been trying to get us killed, and we've been having the Jerry rig weapons. <laughs> I just like this. I'm getting to it. <laughs> like I've been busy running for my life from artillery strikes on a fucking desert planet. I told you didn't want to go on. Fuck you. <laughs> uh, also, it points out that uh, they were able to scan and see that Reed's leg is all fucked up. There is there's no chill on the space station. This is full on Big Brother. Right. Not too much longer after that, we get the charming voice of Roxanne Dawson herself as the voice of the computer. A very limited role, ultimately, probably three different lines of dialogue. And it seems to be asking for the uh, the crew to select a amongst the multiple choices, how they would like to pay for having all of the things that are being highlighted here fixed. You know, that pleased me to no level. I actually see the commerce in action. This yeah, is like Riza. This is not And I don't know if we talked about it, but like the, no, yeah, it was Riza. Someone mentioned that there was a cut scene that specifically detailed the fucking payment terms that Starfleet had to make to get access to Ryza. Like, yeah, like some of our speculation was sort of true. Yeah, <laughs> like here it's like three warp coils. I don't know what else or 20 liters of plasma warp plasma. Yeah, 200 liters of warp plasma is what they end up picking. So what they're talking to is a a view screen, but in the center of the room is what you think is the central computer. And that's the first of the majorly recognizable props. Because that spire that's projecting the Enterprise hologram is the fucking AI core off of Think Tank. Oh, okay, neat. And... I guess the the thing I recognized uh, was it the I don't know if maybe it probably wasn't the Nomad probe. It was, but it looked like a no, that's Nomad probe. It was Nomad. Was that was the one that fixed Reed's leg? No, come on, dude. Really? No, no. It wasn't Nomad because it was too small. Nomad was on was uh, in was in Mayweather's quarters. No, the thing that fixed Reed's leg is fucking Exocomps. Oh, it was the Exocomp, of course. Was well, it was oriented this way. I know it was, yeah. oriented, it was oriented differently. It was up, up and down. To be fair, I wouldn't recognize that thing either had I not played uh, the Decipher CCG religiously. Those exocomps were too good not to screw. And and then you know you had the one show up as a character in Lower Decks. <laughs> uh, was her name Hamster Basket? Uh, it, it was it was something like that. Peanut like Hamper. 
Yeah, I was going to say titty sparkles, but you no, know. it was peanut hamper. So good. Um, so there's this uh, there's this apprehension of oh, we don't know if we can trust this thing. I'm on team trip on all this, which is we don't really have a good option. And uh, the projections on fixing this was like what three days or two days or something. Not even and- two days, day and a half. Reed's like, yeah, listen, the guys at Jupiter Station would have us laid up for like three months. This is a good deal. Let's not use anything we can't replace. But yeah, if they want warp plasma, what's the worst it's going to do with it? Cut to fair trade where we find out that warp plasma is like dirty bomb juice. <laughs> and well, we see that here, too. So, <laughs> uh, they, they make the deal. They say, hey, this is going to be done in 34 hours or whatever. And the... You also have access to our recreation area, which appears to be a just a, a view bay out to see Enterprise. Uh, but when they go in there, uh, to Paul uh, speculates that it is uh, a matter resequencer that it uses energy to form into matter upon request because it's something she's seen before on like a, a different species freighter and asks for a glass of water and receives one. And seeing this magical uh, device suddenly manifest water from nothing, local Florida man, (laughs) uh, Commander Tucker, decides the very first thing he wants to ask for from this machine is a pan-fried catfish, which he then receives and then was like, tries out and goes, "Eh, it's pretty good. This is this is decent. This doesn't taste like Satan's butthole. I am pleasantly surprised. I want to say this is the second time that he has specifically mentioned that. Well, not he's not saying it here, but there was a previous episode where he identifies pan catfish as uh, his favorite food. So that's yeah. And it's a very Florida like food, too. Like if you if you're familiar with the cuisine of the area. A pan fried catfish is a very common item in most restaurants there. I'm not familiar with Florida that level, but I do know that you have an unhealthy crush on trip and I'm willing to take your word on this. Yeah, I, I, he's a dream boat and I love his entire like just very impressed attitude about this whole thing. Like he really likes this place. I like this little shtick they've got going here, which is taking well-established 24th century TNG technology and having these guys floored by it, right? Yeah, in wonder. A, uh, the idea that this thing might be automated and they're dealing with some sort of AI, like there's so much attention called to that and it's like, well, that 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 kind of dates you a little bit because even automation on this level is almost capable now, but like uh, the, the computer system, the replicators, the aforementioned flashing lights that can magically cure wounds, the casual use of the transporter that I guess is another point of limited criticism for me. Like when they are eventually beamed several times throughout this, uh, there's no remorse for souls lost or other concerns that are shared by the enterprise's own transporters, which has not been mentioned in quite some time. I do think that there's less concern over it. Well, they do mention like, hey, it could have just beamed you into space. We're dealing with an unknown here. That could be but the Seska program running this thing. You got to be absolutely. careful. You got to be careful. Uh, but you know, their technology is so obviously advanced. It feels just like part of the story. Like, of course, they have like casual super transporters. They have 24th century technology. That's what this is. The 22nd century accidentally showed up to its own future. Got to hang out there for a while. So it's not the 24th century technology that ends up being the most impressive to me, because once they agree to the terms uh, and the repair station starts doing the repair, what I say? This was 2002. Yes. 2002. So I'm in my junior year of college, sophomore year of college, maybe. I thought the automated process of these arms moving through physically clearing debris in the damaged hull sections scanning damaged areas and then replicating replacement parts and installing them was pretty intricate and looked really good for 
a bullshit TV show. Yeah, there was a lot of care taken to exactly what they were doing. Like, we're not just going to have CG arms putting in plates. They really took a moment to show you the process that was happening and the order in which it was occurring and that it it made sense. Like, and it was really cool to see that actually happen. And not only are they doing magic god camera where you're watching from space, uh, but there's a lot of scenes where there's like viewports. They're eating in the station. They're hanging out. And there's these windows where you see these arms moving around and doing stuff. And I was paying more attention to that in some cases than what was actually, you know, happening with the humans on the screen. I, I think this is the first time that I've really been genuinely impressed with Enterprise's special effects displays. Not to be one to uh, just accept the gift horse. Uh, we've got Reed and we've got uh, Tucker considering if they would like to look it directly in the mouth and having a conversation about giving their hands on some of the sweet, sweet technology while they're hanging out inside the machine they intend to steal from. Probably not the best OPSEC in the world. If it's got the ability to create matter from thin air, maybe it has the ability to eavesdrop on your fucking conversation, boys. But regardless, they decide after having a little bit of come on action uh, to uh, see if they can pull off a little solid snake caper and, uh, you know, crawl through the through the air ducts, air ducts that are uh, smaller than the ones uh, who she went through yet two full grown adults with their shirts on and can manage to get through them. I don't understand. And why. not lose their shirt in the process. Very interesting. Yeah, so Reed's a part of this. Like we said before, part of the repair plan here was the station sent a medical device, which we already said is a repurposed exocomp prop from uh, TNG. And that like magic lighted the wound away to the complete surprise and delight of both Flocks and Reed. Uh, throughout all of this, Archer's had a bad feeling about this, right? And he's been apprehensive to say the least um while it's really trip that initiates the uh hey let's go do some fucking stupid gilligan's island shit <laughs> as is his want i like that uh reads like or he's like uh come on don't don't you want to like you know here's here's what i can tell of the schematics of this place here's where i think the computer core is I really want to see this stuff. You know, we've got the most advanced computer in Starfleet installed on the NX-01. Uh, it's three decks long. The, what I surmise is the computer core for this would fit in, you know, a room half the size of this mess hall we're in. And Reed's just not having, oh, come on, where's your sense of adventure? I love Reed's like, well, I left it in the Romulan minefield. And I'm like, that is exactly the right attitude for a guy to have who just got fucking stapled to the outer hole <laughs> and f should for all intents and purposes be dead uh, had that ridiculous blast shield scheme not worked last episode the ridiculous part of this is of course that they're going to try and pull this shit without running it by the captain whatsoever and and read specifically who is the stickler for rules, protocols and uh, doing things the right way, being involved in it. I do like, though, that in the consequence scene, that sticklerness for rules does come up, right? Like there's continuity in what they talked about in regards to that in the prior episode. Yeah, although, so although we, we don't want to skip past the the failed solid snake thing too quickly because as you noted on the trauma support group today, uh, quite a little uh, a pl a prop usage uh, as they are trying to get this very formidable ceiling tile out of the way so they can go do their space heist. Uh, that futuristic tile is, in fact, uh, the the filter that you change out of your furnace every few months. <laughs> yeah, was that 25 by 6 by 1? Yeah, yeah, I think I bought a three pack at, at fucking Costco when I was there last yeah. time. I mean, it, I've never seen. I don't think there's anything I can point to in Voyager or Enterprise up to this point 
that is just such a mundane piece of shit prop to be used. And you're, you want me to believe that this was a, a ceiling access panel. I know what a heater filter looks like. That is a heater filter. But yeah, they, they pull it off. He boosts them up. As you said, they're rolling around, completely spitting in the face of anything they tried to sell us back in Shockwave Part 2, where it required Hoshi to be up in there. Uh, and they start shimming down this Jeffrey's tube towards what they believe the computer core room would be. Uh, as they get close, a little alarm goes off. This winky butthole door closes before they can get to it. And then as a defensive measure, the space station transports both of them, not out into the icy vacuum of space, but drops them directly on the bridge in front of uh, to Paul. And uh, they get caught red handed. How nice, how nice of the machine to not murder them. <laughs> they get called up in front of the captain who reads in the riot act and uh, gives them some military discipline and points out that Reed had noted that that had been lax. So he would no longer be lax and that that was really fucking stupid of them. Restricts him the cores, but then in classic tropey fashion stops them from leaving and saying, okay, boys, I'm on your side. What'd you find in there? <laughs> like now that I've, that I've admonished you for doing something stupid, the stupid thing that you did actually does confirm some of my priors. So let's talk it over. <laughs> and as they discuss what they have found, we, we get a call from Phlox. And I guess there is some setup to this. Earlier, we saw Mayweather with his shirt off. Which Boy, is a, howdy. Which is an impressive. Let me tell you how this dude got fired. <laughs> impressive sight listen on this show filled with people who lived in the gym for the duration lest it be their turn to take their shirt off not wanting to be embarrassed and we've seen some buff bods as a consequence from all involved anthony montgomery is a sculpted adonis of a man this This dude is jacked how did it take over a season to get this guy out of a shirt he is he is literally perfect looking it's like all he doesn't have any acting ability because it's all in in here it's all in his pecs dude like wow take all the virtue signaling or whatever you want to say or complaints about carbon creek where with uh to paul's nipples behind the sheet i'm sorry to gilf's nipples behind the sheet this dude might as well just be in like a fucking wife beater while he's at the con just flexing guns (laughs) So every time he goes to open his mouth and like ill deliver a line, it'd be like, well, the dude looks like a million bucks. I guess he belongs on the bridge after all. I am just saying that Anthony Montgomery looks like a man who never spent a night alone. He didn't want to spend alone. You know what I mean? That's a guy who has never tasted a McDonald's French fry. (laughs) (laughs) a, A body mass index that low right there. Uh, very impressive. And, uh, he's in his quarters, which eh, all of the quarters on enterprise have this fucking glass shelf with like these suspension cables holding it up. Right. seems uh, insecure in space trans transit, not only insecure. Like, first of all, you have to look in and say, well, anything I'm going to put on this shelf, I'm okay with it slamming to the fucking ground, but also the hubris of having glass, <laughs> <laughs> potentially broken glass shards in zero G while you're being swatted around uh, in a space fight, like bad moves. I'm I'm wondering if the NX 2 also had these, these shelves or if they learned a, a sharp lesson. I'm just saying it was only last season that the artificial gravity plating would just fail for no reason. So uh, it doesn't even have to be a disaster to be a disaster. But he gets a call from what sounds like the captain to go down to shuttle bay one. And then he goes down there and there's like, oh, like this, this blast point on the wall. He's like, that's weird. And he turns around and it's like, ah, and then. So the magic genie space repair station has rules. And one of the rules is no crew is allowed in areas that are being actively repaired, which. Archer relays on to people, make sure that we don't have any of these guys in these repair areas. Right. 
this shuttle oh no it was a, it was a, it was a docking bay right yeah was specifically being repaired at this point which is why uh Mayweather's like captain why would you know I, I thought that was being repaired and Archer reassures no I need you down here on the double um, so he's going into a no no zone and to the show's credit they don't play like sinister music or anything else like overly cheesy like we can put together that fuckery is afoot but uh, yeah he sees the melted wall he gets Scott and we move along when we cut back to what happened, supposedly, Flax is like, we need to come here immediately. And there's a body and it's this that's that same hot Adonis we just saw. And I'm like, please be dead. <laughs> please what, actually what be if, dead. What if this is the Tasha Yar moment and Joe's just done a really great job and like no one's spoiled for me that Mayweather dies and 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 this is going to be like a really cool part because they even reference his sister in this too right he's mm-hmm. writing a letter to his sister and i'm like oh my god like they're setting up to replace him when they were saying that you know his sister would be a great replacement like it's happening it's coming true i was really happy i wish i could have given you that gift peter i just wanted, i wish i wish Sussman could have given me this gift so the the story that flox has is that maybe mm, there's real dead- quick Real quick, Roxanne Dawson directing this. Mm -hmm. Do you think his shirt was off in the script, or do you think that's uh, the Roxanne touch? (laughs) Roxanne saw what she was working with. Here's how we connect Roxanne Dawson in her directing stuff. Uh, Is it unnecessarily sexy? The Jizz Monster episode, absolutely. Uh, That scene with his shirt off. Check the box there. What was her third entry into Enterprise? And during an incident where the captain is canoodling with his first officer and with the blanket. I don't know if you call that sexy, though. Not unless you're uh, a masochist who enjoys watching people get their face beaten like Archer. Mm. It's missing. We'll put, there, a pin, but... we'll, we'll put a pin in it. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'm willing to accept that Roxanne Dawson like had a double take. And then they had like wolf eyes and then went a wooga and then was like, get that man's shirt off in the next scene. You know, at this take, that's not bad. But for this next one, take your shirt off. Then she does the the Dr. Hmm. Evil pinky to the mouth. In this scene, you shall take your shirt off. Or she saw like a rough cut of uh, Carbon Creek and was like, I need to get one for us. I need to get one for the ladies in here. This like, is some bullshit. I need to, I need to write this ship. Back in the Polynesian resort where everybody had like a bikini girlfriend and Harry Kim had the fucking Swedish volleyball team that he was banging out. And then they gave uh, Balana the dude in the banana hammock. Yeah, like it's, it's time it's time for the ladies to have a have a freebie. I like it. But uh, it, it's this this hunk of Adonis is dead. He died of isolytic shock from this you know, this repair process. Everyone is crushed. Like you said, there's like a lot of discussion of why is he here? How did this happen? Why didn't he know not to be here? Why did why did this happen at all? And this doesn't fit. And I want to give credit for being a uh, mid scene probably not a real death. I think that the cast does a good job of selling the grief and not phoning it in. And that is a constant sore spot with Star Trek. And most of the time I'd say in Voyager, when someone would air quote die, it was a real half ass effort by the cast to try and sell any sort of grief or, or problem with the situation. Yeah, and they were they were doing it in that sort of he was so young and we had barely got to know him way up to and including that, like the captain had put off having breakfast with him and he regretted it, obviously, in that moment. That was that was a neat touch. And then you had Hoshi come in during the autopsy or again, more continuity where she references that she's seen 12 dead bodies before. So she's ready to see another one. And that's Which a was, reference to uh, second episode after the, well, the premiere it was her focus. Spider episode people. Where they, where they find the spider people. Yeah. And she had major issues with it then and had to grow past it. And Flax is kind of like, yeah, we'll see in a bunch of dead aliens 
even if they are strung upside down in fucking cocoons being bled dry like dogs, like uh, still a little different than seeing, you know, a co-worker. But not much longer into this interaction where they're talking about the departed Mayweather, Phlox is on to something that's odd, and that is that this isn't actually Mayweather. This is a copy, a clone, a replicant, if you will. And he's able to determine this because even the little viruses from a recent inoculation, which should still be alive if not thriving because of the cause of death, are also dead. So it's that whatever made it can't make anything alive. It can only create perfectly crafted copies of inert material. A nice Mm -hmm. touch to explain how it is they figured it out. The nice touch for me is that the epiphany moment of uh, Phlox smelling something wrong didn't seem like it was a one in a million catch and that it only happened because of this conversation with Hoshi, which I always feel is so flimsy and disingenuous. Like when it's like Neil, Neelix, thanks for giving me this engineering idea so I can breach warp 10. (laughs) Well, I like Neelix. So and Neelix is defining trait in my mind at this point anymore is that he's the epiphany enabler but like there's a lot of stuff like oh thanks for having this fucking conversation with me about bubble gum because now i'm gonna put two and two together and fucking cheat the plot on this like it seems like it's something he would have eventually caught anyways he just caught it a little sooner with hoshi there and um playing into the uh, the praise you heap on him for being the most lived in physician portrayal Mm -hmm. Uh, i think this is a nice entry into that isn't there some mention about jello somewhere uh that was part of the prank oh no yeah the prank what i like there she's like oh i was hoping mayweather was just jerking me around and you know he's such a kidder even though Mm -hmm. i've never seen any evidence of this at all yeah Uh, she seems to be describing personality which mayweather does not have (laughs) At that point, they could have derailed, derailed the entire episode and found out that, like, Hoshi's from an alternate reality. What What do you mean? He he was playing jokes and being funny and, and likable. The only thing I could tell you about this guy is that he sucks at rock climbing and he's kind of a crybaby. Uh, what I like there is she's like, basically, he tried to trick her into talking to a plate of Jello, only they can't call it Jello. So they had to call it fucking uh, gelatin because Jello's Correct. trade worked. And as we found out by uh, Green Jelly, you don't fuck with Jello. Jello wins. So they call the captain back down, who's like not having this bullshit and went and yelled at the computer for a while. Punched it, too. And it's like, you break it, you buy it. <laughs> Ed says, yeah, so clearly some something fuckery is amiss. If the actual Mayweather is still somewhere around. We got to fucking find him. And that's when they get their plan together. And the plan is that predictably they're going to use uh, Tucker and Reed's prior misadventures in uh, heading into the, the air ducts to try and find a way to get into the back of the house. And while Archer, Reed and T'Pol try to act on this caper to get back there to try and find some answers, they send in a, uh, trip to essentially Karen the machine yeah they're like they're like <laughs> trip we need someone who definitely will will be heard who will refuse to take no for an answer will demand customer service at the level that he he needs that someone who's willing to ask to speak with the manager and indeed uh, trip is is up for this task and he rolls in with all of the warp plasma on the dolly, but is like, no, first, I want to talk about the manufacturing specs on all of the bolts. I'm not I happy make- with the service that I've received, and I'm going to call the phone number on the back of this Wendy's receipt. I, <laughs> I am definitely going to tell you the person who is who runs this trucking company about your driving, <laughs> and that it was not good, sir. I have your truck number, sir. So the the plan is actually charming in its basicness. They don't have like a technological answer. It's read, go forward until you get sucked into the transporter again. 
Okay, cool. Now blow that spot up now that we know that's where it's coming from. All right. Is this where it is? Okay, blow that up so we can get in here. Hey, we're in the back of the house. We just used guns. It's uh, all the stuff we criticize time and again for, which is shoot the problem with a phaser. Only this time, it's not a time paradox, so it makes sense. You're shooting the sensor on the wall. I, this is uh, this part of the plot I really liked because now we move into like the portal aperture science phase, right? right? Everything that the customer, everything that's customer facing is clean, white, pristine, very sterile, uh, presentable. That is the product. Now you get to see how the sausage is made. They get through this little dilating butthole uh, and they crawl back there and you see this dusty ass horror show where it is the real central computer uh, covered in cobwebs and dust. And there are dozens and dozens of humanoids hanging from the rafters in these makeshift hammocks with all sorts of tubes and stuff coming out. And it's a pretty gruesome sight. And there's no GLaDOS in a potato, nor any Cave Johnson voiceovers to get you through it. <laughs> like <laughs> you are, you're here for it. It's dirty, and you get to see some of the wide-ranging uh, makeups of different races. There's a Klingon in there. There's a Cardassian in there. There's like was there? Yeah, there was a there was apparently a Vaudoir. I was there. really hoping that they would. Is that in the Alpha? I remember the Vaudoir piece from reading the Vaudoir memory alpha back in the day that they were one of the aliens in here. Yeah, what a good time to to fit some um, some Easter eggs in. Low exposure to bullshit, you know, like eh, why not throw in. some Frangies in there, right? Yeah, could, you could have put a Herogen in there. Like, could be no. anything. Yeah, it could have been a Herogen. They did have access to some pretty sweet tech. Mm-hmm. Uh... And and going back to my earlier comment, the episode leaves you to draw your own conclusions. They're not giving details, right? We it's clear that the and this was it was Archer's concern that like this seems like a lot of work for just twenty liters of warp plasma, right? There there has to be a greater like what is what's really going on here? Well, that's what's going on. The the Space Station AI has maliciously tricked a crew member, staged to death, and and inflicted the iron price, right? The pound of flesh. Uh, Most crews have been content to leave and leave the crew member behind. Uh, Unfortunately for the Space Station on this one, they are inexplicably drawn to try and care about Mayweather for some unforeseen reason. Listen, they need to, they need, they saw him with his shirt off and they're like, someday we're going to need black lightning. Like he's going to have to be the face man for some honeypot maneuver that we pull with some alien babes. We need yeah, to have that. We, we might have to have that right enter for us. a magic Mike male stripper uh, event to get access to this corridor of space. And it's certainly not going to be reading those little chicken legs of his. No, holding no. down the fort. This is what this is what Mayweather is here for. Fly the ship. Look intense. Take his shirt off. That's the order of operations. Mm-hmm. Disappoint us that he's not a chubby old white guy from Sequest. Sequest. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they find they find Reed. They unplug him, and they they beat their escape. And as they attempt to make that escape, uh, we get uh, perhaps the most predictable plot twist, which is they turn the payment into a bomb. Put a little little oopsie doodle switch on all of that explosive warp plasma and decide uh, to detonate it in order to uh, make the uh, AI release them from their captivity. You're glossing over some stuff here. When when they find Mayweather and they go to free him, like they pull the two. It's so low budget, but it's still gross. They don't want to show anything like matrixed into his spine or like even IVs, but there's two tubes up each of his sleeves and Archer pulls him out, just blood and shit pour out of him or hydraulic fluid or something. Something, <laughs> something not good. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, it's, it's it's that nice October vaguely Halloween horror touch to it. Obviously, the computer's now pissed off because it's the jig is up. I like that it turns the hands, the robot hands that have been rebuilding the hull 
and so just fucking grab just straight out grabs the saucer section and they can't get away for the first time ever i would say this is arguably the most technologically advanced thing that enterprise has encountered to this point right yeah definitely not a doubt ironically this is also the first time the fucking not photon torpedoes have ever been really effective no i take it back it fucked the nausicans up too but uh they're like how do we get out of here and they're like well we can't just go to impulse it's going to rip the hull apart and if we use the torpedoes it's so close it might cause us problems Ugh, what other options do we have and it's like the the phaser the fa- use, use the fucking phase the phasers that just rocked the ass off of the uh mars attack guys like come on yeah, you just cut these things off. But yeah, the fact that they shoot the little torpedo and it goes, mm, and they're like, yeah, just do it again. Mm-hmm. It was clearly not effective. You get out of there, the thing's exploding, and then Reed's kind of like, oh, I was hoping it was going to explode a little bit more. Like, no, remember, like, jet fuel has to hit whatever before it can melt steel beams. <laughs> but it does. It ends up melting spilled steel beams. They They get away. Mayweather wakes up in sick bay and he's like, gosh, gosh, everybody, what happened? And they explain. I, I, I do also like during the escape. I don't know at what point the, the phase pistols became bazookas where they're just blowing holes in fucking walls. Like everything they shoot with the phase, the hand phasers in this is like a 10 out of 10 explosion. Well, they're just they, they're using that vision mode where they can see that's the wall. If they shoot it, it breaks, you oh, know, from like from like the Arkham Knight elite games. forces. Yeah. Yeah. They're flying away to Paul's looking in the little science thing as they watch their next door score, like go down 80 points because they've just destroyed the only fucking truck. Yeah, stop. they blew up the buckies. Holy shit. They had pan cr- fried catfish in there. Maybe that's delicious. what the tellerites were saying. Like, hey, there's a sweet ass. Uh, really good repair station up the road. It has the best milkshakes that you could ever dream of. FYI, it's going to harvest the weakest cast member on your ship. Don't be prepared to lose something that you don't value. Yeah, it's not. It's it's it is such a good repair station. Not only is it going to repair the ship, it's also going to fix the cast. <laughs> evil space buckies. <laughs> it's not evil. This is a really good space station. It it took him away while also creating a scene where they could have contacted his sister to come in and fix it. Like mm. this is the ultimate mm. full service fixer. God, what a great space station. So they leave the thing. It's blown up. I really expected at this point when they're in the sick bay and they're like, well, look, you know, this neural uplink, like it was using his brain for processing power and the human brain. So good, blah, blah, blah. I figured he was gonna be like, yeah, I was in the shared reality slash juggalo tech. Everybody was there. They were telling me horror stories that suck, blah, blah, blah. But there's no plot exposition at all, right? It's just, I don't remember anything. I'm happy to be back though. And you're left to your own devices as to everybody else's story and everything else, right? Correct. You know, it's left unknown. This is some something that maybe was designed to do this. Maybe it got out of hand, but whatever it was, everybody else there was fucking brains were mush. You were the only one we could save anyway. Because you never had any really brains to start off. Yeah, they were started. <laughs> I mean, they, they were struggling to find, you know, past your pecs, what, what yeah. there was. <laughs> and, you know, good, good thing we got you out in time. And of course, you cut back one little dun 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 stinger where it's fixing itself. Oh, my God. I wrote in my notes. I'm like, man, I hope this fucking space station becomes like the new persistent villain of this season. This, this is this is the, this is the villain of the season. It's the space, space station. station Seska. Well, let me read the intro for the next week. We're about to reach what is often called one of the worst episodes of Star Trek. Season two, oh. episode five, a night in sick bay. In this Hugo nominated episode. Yeah, I know. Archer spends a night in sick bay with Dr. Phlox after Porthos picks up a deadly virus on an alien planet. During his night in sick bay, he learns more about himself, including his attraction to his first officer and friend to Paul. What he needs to do is have a very long conversation with Phlox where 
they both come to the conclusion that their decision to leave that planet suffering with space aids was wrong and maybe they should go back. That's the episode I want in, in sick bay. Uh, what is with the Hugo award? It it's been invoked before. I forget what episode they popped it out on Voyager, but I want to say it was also a shitter is the Hugo Gernsback award. Like a, uh, a Razzie. Uh, it's supposed to be for legitimate science fiction, but I don't know how this one got a Razzie. This you, you want to talk about the absolute pinnacle of Enterprise's horniness for no reason except to be horny. You, you can circle this one and put an exclamation point next to it. It is notorious for this and uh, thus is not well regarded by by most. So that's what we're in for. We went from pretty good for you, meh, for me to, I think, universally great this week. Right back into the shitter. Right back into it. Well, that's what we signed up for, right? We're not watching Enterprise to be impressed. <laughs> <laughs> well, but we hope you're impressed by our reviews of Star Trek Enterprise. We hope you'll continue to listen. And therefore, we'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>